afternoon. I'm going to say a Michigan phrase and see how many of you all understand. G, what did I just say? Did you eat? Yeah. G, how was it? Was it good? Raise your hand if it was good. All right. Raise your hand if you're going to stay awake. Oh, help us. Help us. All right. Just a couple of announcements before we get into the first session this afternoon. First of all, there are children's activities beginning now underneath the tent. Uh, it's like arts and crafts, that sort of thing. So uh, if there are any children here that you would like to send them over there to the tent, that begins right now. So please don't forget about that. The Lima and Noblesville youth groups are coming to sing for us. As they're coming, let's pray and ask God's help in this service right now. Lord, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for the privilege that we have of being able to gather here together to learn more about you, Lord, to learn about how that we can be conformed into your, uh, transformed into your image each and every day. God, we, we are thankful for that. I pray right now for each and every young person that's here this afternoon. Would you help us to listen exactly to what it is that you want uh, for us in this afternoon service? We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for what you're going to do. God, would you please help these youth groups as they sing, and then help Brother Fuller as he would speak. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Lord bless the Lima and Noblesville Pilgrim Holiness youth groups as they sing, and then Brother Fuller as he would speak to us.
Thank you, young people. That was absolutely beautiful. Amen. Did you enjoy that? Praise God. It's easy to preach when the music ushers us into the presence of God. And I thank you for that well-prepared, well-delivered message and song. Well, it is a joy to be at Central Pennsylvania Youth Convention. There is a thought in 1 Peter chapter 5 that I want to lift for you this afternoon, if God will be pleased to help me. These verses will be familiar, the first couple of verses that I'm going to read. Verse number 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Well, my text verse is verse number 10, and this verse you probably will not be as familiar with. Peter says, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, strengthen, establish, settle you. Father, would you bless the preached word? These few moments give us something that will help Make eternity what you've intended it for to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thursday, January 15, 2009 was a cold, clear winter day. U.S. Airways Flight 1549 left LaGuardia Airport for Charlotte, North Carolina. On climb out four and a half miles northwest of the airport at exactly 327 p.m., at an altitude of 2,818 feet, a flock of Canadian geese struck the airplane, causing a loss of all engine power. After assessing their position in relationship to the available airport runways, the captain and the co-pilot decided that their best chance for survival was to land the plane on the Hudson River. After passing over the George Washington Bridge at about 900 feet, that Airbus A320 belly flopped in the Hudson River. The entire flight lasted about five minutes. It's an unforgettable, iconic scene. 155 people standing on the wings of that sinking plane, desperately waiting for rescue as the icy waters of the Hudson River threatened at any moment to become their watery grave. There was no time to consider handbags or baggage, briefcases or cell phones, or even coats and hats. All had to be left behind in the mad dash to exit before the plane would succumb to the chilly waters of the Hudson. My coat, my purse, thought passenger, Karen Hill, as she stopped, stepped out into the frigid air, she had no choice but to leave them behind, back at her seat, 18E, never expecting to see them again. Yet somehow all those personal items have been returned to their rightful owners, fully cleaned up and restored as if they had never been lost in the first place. ABC News reports, and I, I use the article freely. It reads, after the accident, U.S. Airways called Global BMS, a Fort Worth-based company that specializes in disaster recoveries. When the jet was hauled out of the Hudson and placed on a barge for inspection by accident investigators, Global official Mark Rocco was there, walking the cabin to tag and remove personal items to return them. And I quote, he said, it looked like it had been in a dirty car wash. A lot of the overhead bins were still closed and a lot of things were still stored under the seats. He said, I saw a wallet on the floor and wondered why it hadn't floated out of the plane. Everything was soaked and smelled of jet fuel, but every item the global workers found was tagged with a unique tracking number bagged and placed on a refrigerated truck bound for a Texas warehouse. Freezing things puts things into suspended animation, Rocco says. Back in Texas, Global began defrosting, cleaning, and restoring everything it possibly could. 
including everything inside carry-ons and suitcases, figuring out who owned what. While many items couldn't be fully restored, such as computer hard drives, cell phones, shrunken clothing, and the like, the truth is most items were meticulously spit-shined, dry-cleaned, reconstructed, and refurbished to at or near original condition. Finally, many months later, Marion Bruce, an executive from Charlotte, North Carolina, got a visit from Deborah Thompson, U.S. Airways Director of Emergency Response, who personally delivered back to her her possessions, her briefcase, her purse, her mink coat, and a carry-on suitcase with all of its contents, including a large diamond ring given to her by her husband for their 25th wedding anniversary. Included in the stash of returned items was her boarding pass for seat 5D, which she said she would frame and put on the wall. Can I tell you this afternoon that the promise of restoration is God's promise? In our text this, af this afternoon, it reads, Paul, Peter says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect. The word that is used in the Greek New Testament, it's translated here perfect, is used to describe the process of mending nets. You go fishing and you use your net and because of its use it becomes torn, it becomes damaged and every once in a while you have to stop and restore the net. You have to make it perfect. You have to put it back in its original condition. You have to restore it. And one, in fact, the English Standard Version actually takes the liberty to translate this Greek word as restore. If you read this verse in the English Standard Version, it would, and I know Brother Durst is not going to like this, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it says... It says in the English Standard Version, after that you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore. He's going to restore you, he says. Peter says he's going to restore you after that you've suffered a while. Good. Thirteen times in the Greek New Testament this word is used. It's used in a broad, a broad context. It's used to describe the, the mending of a broken bone. You break a bone and it needs restored. It needs mended. It needs put back together. It needs to be taken back to its original condition. So it's useful. I tell you this afternoon, this is not just a promise in the New Testament. This is a promise in the Old Testament. Because the God of all grace is a God of restoration. In, Joel's, in Joel chapter 2, Joel's prophecy chapter 2, verse 25 and 26, it says, And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed." Oh, thanks be to God. There is a God who, who has deigned to promise us restoration when we find ourselves in need of mending, when we find something is broken, something is out of joint. God says, I have grace for that. I have the grace of restoration. You may be a sincere Christian, you may be here this afternoon and you've been in the services and you, the convention's come into a close, uh, but when, when you're sitting listening to this message this afternoon, you have to acknowledge deep down in your heart, your soul, something still feels uh, not quite right, something feels not quite mended. And all I've come this afternoon to tell you is that there's a God who has promised grace to restore you however long it may take. He says, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect or restore you. The promise of restoration is the promise of the Bible. He's the God of all grace. And this God of all grace promises restoring grace to put things in order, to mend the nets, to set the bone right. And by the way, the man who wrote this text had personal experience. 
because he had a massive blowout. He had a tremendous failure, but the Lord Jesus Christ made an appointment with him on the, shores, on the seashores of Galilee, and there in a private dinner, he asked him three questions, uh, three times, uh, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And, and you're familiar with that passage of scripture. Listen, friend, there was grace to restore Peter, and there's grace to restore you. Not only is there a promise of restoration, but there is the providence, the providence of restoring grace. There's an old Turkish proverb that says, God has feet of wool, but hands of iron. You may not hear him coming after you, but you will know it when he gets a hold of you. I had no idea I was going to get saved in that September revival meeting, that little Christian day school. I had no idea that God was on my trail. But I'm thankful I can look back and tell you he had been preparing the way for months. He had been following me hard. He was on my trail. I had no idea because God has feet of wool. You may not hear him coming, but he's got hands of iron. And when he gets a hold of you, you'll know it. And from that Friday morning in September, my life has never been the same. From 1995 to 2024, my life has been changed because there is a God who was after me. And I'm telling you, he's after you if you're not right this afternoon. Every Christian young person should read Courtney Anderson's To the Golden Shore. He describes the conversion of Adnarm Judson vividly in that book. After commencement, Adnan went home to his parents and informed them that he was an atheist and planned to taste the pleasures of the world. His father tried to reason with him and his mother was brokenhearted, but Adnan would not be deterred. He left for New York City intending to be a playwright and although the, and although the excitement of his new circumstances drove from his mind the arguments of his father, he could not forget the tears of his mother. Because of Adnarm's atheistic beliefs and his rejection of his parents' standards, God allowed him to fall into the depths of sin. And after a year in New York City, Adnarm Judson decided to travel west. The very first night, he stopped at a small inn. There was one bed left, separated from a dying man by only a curtain. But though the night was still, he could not sleep. In the next room beyond the partition, he could hear sounds, not very loud, footsteps coming and going, a board creaking, low voices, a groan or a gasp. These did not disturb him unduly, not even the realization that a man might be dying. Death was a commonplace enough in um, Adnarm's New England. It, it might come to anyone at any age. But what disturbed him was the thought that the man in the next room might not be prepared for death. Was he himself? It was a tear in these fantastically unwielding ideas. But as they presented themselves, another part of himself jeered. Midnight fancies. That part said scornfully. What a skin deep thing, this free thinking philosophy of Adnarm Judson valedictorian scholar, teacher, ambitious man must be. What would the classmates at Brown University say to these terrors of the night who thought of him as bold in thought? Above all, uh, what would Eames say? Jacob Eames, the clear-headed, skeptical, witty, talented Jacob Eames. He imagined Eames' laughter and felt shame. Eames had been the young man that had talked him out of his father's religion at Brown University. He was the young man that attacked everything that his parents had tried to instill with him through his childhood and his teenage years. When Adnarm awoke, the sun was streaming in at the window. His apprehension had vanished with the darkness. He could hardly believe that he had given in to such weaknesses. He, he dressed quickly and ran downstairs looking for the innkeeper. He found his host, asked for the bill, and perhaps noticing the man sober faced, asked casually whether the young man in the next room was better. He is dead, was the answer. Did you know who he was? Oh, yes. Young man from the college in Providence. Name was Eames. Jacob. Jacob Eames. 
How Adnarm got through the next few hours, never could remember. Only the words, lost! 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 Jacob's lost! The truths of Scripture struck deep in his heart. He knew then that his father was right. He knew Eames was lost, lost for eternity. Adonai returned home and made the startling announcement to his parents that he was enrolling in Andover Theological College for the fall of 1818, and he was not a Christian when he did it. In December, he trusted Christ as his Lord and Savior. In June of the following year, he placed himself under his father's authority and joined the church where his father pastored. This was the Adoniram Judson whose six, whose six and thirty years of unwearied devotion as a missionary in Burma won for him the humble appellation of the Apostle of Burma. All because there's a God in heaven who sees every young man who gets talked out of his father's religion and follows him to wherever he goes. On the very first night that Adoniram Judson thought he was escaping to the life that he wanted. God had arranged for the very young man at Brown that had talked him out of it all to be in the same building, separated by a curtain. Can I tell you, there's a God of all grace who is not just interested in promising you restoration, but has the power and the providence to bring about circumstances in your life so that you come face to face with the reality that though he has feet of feathers, he has hands of iron. And he's on your trail. He's on your trail. There is the promise of restoring grace. There's the providence of restoring grace. And there's the power of restoring grace. Do you know how many days there was between Peter's failure on Good Friday and his sermon on Pentecost Sunday. Seven weeks, one day. Fifty days. I told you the story about the miracle on the Hudson to try to illustrate there's a big difference between being rescued and being restored. Those 155 people that were on that plane, about 70 on each side on the wings and in flotation devices as they waited rescue. Moments away from giving way to hypothermia and dying, they were rescued in the nick of time. About 20 minutes from the time the plane hit the belly flopped in the Hudson to the final person was rescued. Some of them were just minutes away from hypothermia taking their lives. They were rescued. It's wonderful to be rescued, to be delivered from a certain death. I told you that illustration because it's a powerful illustration of what God wants to do in every single life. He doesn't want to just rescue you. He wants to take you back to a place of usefulness and a place of service, a place where you can testify to the glory and the power of the risen Christ. Peter had a massive failure, unequaled perhaps in history given all of the different aspects of his failure, to deny Christ on the very night of his betrayal, to have so profusely said he would not, and then to do it, not once but repeatedly. But ever has a man been so fully restored to where the Holy Ghost came upon him in that upper room and he spilled out of that upper room on fire with passion, with conviction, with an unshakable confidence that the one that they crucified, that God has now raised him and made him Lord and Christ. Gone were the oaths. Gone were the denials. Gone was the fear. All evaporated. Nothing but but bold proclamation that the only way to the Father is through the cross. Preach the most powerful sermon that's ever been preached. 3,000 swept into the kingdom of God until they were cut to the heart with such conviction that they cried out, what can we do? Repent and be baptized. Wash away your sins. Five minutes. 
I thought on the way here, I thought, well, it's going to be a miracle this afternoon. Either somebody's going to get saved or I'm actually going to preach during, and be done at 2 o'clock, which should probably be the shortest message I've ever preached. I preached in Africa a couple of weeks ago. Day after Thanksgiving, we flew to Nairobi, got in a vehicle, traveled five and a half hours to a college. On Tuesday of that trip, we went to a, out a mission station in the afternoon. I was in a pair of jeans. I was in a long sleeve t-shirt, had a cap on. We had no intention of going to church or preaching. We got there, the little, uh, I mean, just, you wouldn't call it a church in America. I mean, it was just a, a shed with a metal roof and, and a dirt floor. It was more than 100 people in that building at 2 o'clock Tuesday afternoon waiting for service. And I didn't even know until two minutes before they, they leaned over and said, we're going to have you preach. <laughs> well, I, didn't even have a, I didn't even have a tie on well, I got up and I preached John 3.16. Ten great things about John 3.16. For God, the greatest lover, so loved, the greatest compassion in the world, the greatest need that he gave, the greatest sacrifice, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whosoever, the greatest opportunity, believeth in him, the greatest faith, should not perish, the greatest damnation, but have the greatest hope, everlasting life. I preached ten points <laughs> through an interpreter. And she, he did not translate like Thelma, I can tell you that. It was stop and go. What a joy to preach with her. Wow. Poof. But you know what? I got done, sat down. It was too short. Guy got up. He said, we're going to have him come up and preach a second time. He said, uh, in the West, he said, you have watches. In Africa, we have time. So I got up and preached again. Amen. Two rounds. In the last two or three minutes that I have, can I just tell you this? There's a God in heaven who wants so to rescue you and to restore you. That those looking on will know it never happened. They'll not even know it happened. If I had the time, I'd talk about the trilogy of Jesus. That beautiful story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Don't have the time, but you know the sheep, the silver, the sun, all three lost. But oh, I love to preach. I love to preach about the restoration of that boy. The robe and the ring and the sandals and the fatted calf. Oh, there's such grace to restore you. I don't care where you've gone or how far sin has kept you. One of the greatest preachers in the holiness movement two or three generations ago, a man by the name of Paul Lucas, Started out well. God helped him to start, I think, 12 or 13 churches on their district. He was a district leader. He said, I preached to 100 people on Sunday nights in our little holiness church. God was doing wonderful things. But unfortunately, somebody lied about him. Hurt him deeply. Waited for those in positions of authority to, to make it right, to humble themselves, to get it all worked out. It never happened. He ended up becoming bitter lost his wife, lost his children, became an alcoholic, chain smoker, having preached holiness, powerfully used by God. God was on his trail, and it's a fascinating story of how God rescued him. He said, he said on November 30th of the year that he started back to God, he said, he said, I did not know how to pray. He said, I had forgotten how to pray. Hey, listen to me. We, we say some of the stupidest things sometimes. We say when someone backslides, someone leaves, they say, well, they know what they need to do to get back. No, they have no idea. You start walking against light and it becomes darkness and you have no idea how to get back. He said on November 30th, he said, I quit everything that was quittable. He was an alcoholic. He was addicted to cigarettes. He was a womanizer. He was just a mess. He said, on November 30th, I told God, you said if I would confess, you would forgive. And from November 30th until January the 6th, he said, I do not believe it was an exaggeration to say I prayed hundreds of times a day. 
God, you said if I would confess, you would forgive. November 6th, he was visiting his son Paul in Ohio. Paul had gone on to make a life for himself. He was now a doctor, respected man in his community, Paul Jr. And Paul Sr. said, you know, he said, Paul, he said, I've been, I've been seeking God. I've been trying to get back to God. And I said, he said, I know I've never prayed with you, but he said, I'd like to pray before I leave today. Oh, Paul's brother and his wife, had, they'd already gone out in the car. It kind of been a family get together for the holiday. And Paul Jr. said he went running outside to get his uncle to, and aunt to come in. He said, I've never, de- I've never seen my dad pray. He said, I'm not, I, don't want, I want to miss this and I want you to miss it. And Paul Lucas got down on his knees by the fireplace. He said, I had no clue even how to pray. He said, I just started with what I could remember. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he said, when I said that, the Holy Ghost came and was poured out upon him with such a witness that he had been brought back. He jumped up and he shouted in every room in the house, weeping and shouting. Paul Jr.'s wife was so moved by it, she said to her husband, unconverted, unsaved, not raised in any holiness background, she said, Paul, I've never seen anything like this. Is there any way I could get what your daddy just got? And they got her down on the, by the sofa and prayed her clear through. As far as I know, she lived the life till she died. And Paul Lucas became one of the most effective preachers in our movement over that whatever it was, a decade or whatever, before he went went to heaven. I just told you that to tell you this. If you've been in this convention and you've not yet been restored and you don't even know for sure how to get back, I came to tell you there's a God, the God of all grace, who is on your trail. Amen. God bless you.